Thank you all for joining us here today. Good morning. All right, welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful. We are honored to be called by you to be gathered here in your name. Today, Lord, we come to praise you, to give you glory, to thank you, to tell you that we are so thankful, God. We love you. We love you because you first loved us. We know you because you first knew us. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you all the power, Lord, power over our lives to change them, to mold them, to heal them, to cure us, God, to touch us with your healing hand, bless us with your all-knowing mind, to comfort us with your great compassion. And Father, we're here today because you are God, because you are great, and you gave us Jesus Christ to bring us to the presence of your very throne and adopt us into your family and give us a place in your kingdom. And we are thankful, God, for this small opportunity we have today to gather here to bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Okay. Oh, if you have your Bible, we're going to turn to uh, Galatians. We'll be in chapter 4, starting in verse 12, 12 through 20 today. Uh, we're continuing on with our um, theme, uh, Who's Your Father? We're learning a lot. We learned that the Bible said clearly in 1 John chapter 3 that the uh, children of God were easy to spot, God says. The Bible says they're easy to see. And so are the children of the enemy. And without the word of God, our lives would not nearly be as blessed as they are. God says clearly, I see the children of the enemy and I see the children of my son. And the children of God are blessed with holiness and righteousness and seek a godly life. I want to remind you today also that, uh, as Doug said, we're going to have a baptism here after the service. Anyone who wants to stay is welcome to see uh, Brother Caesar, who's a very blessed man of God. He said encouragement to all of us here, watching him grow in the Lord. And he'll be baptized um, out in the lobby area after the service. You're welcome to stay. And Mary Jane tells me there will be cake. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay, the great news. Okay, so uh, as we read the Word of God, it's impossible to read this Word the way we read it here in Brentwood Lighthouse. I like to call it the, uh, the hard truth or the loving and difficult truth. It's impossible to read this Word the way we do and not be changed. This is what changed my life. This is how my life changed to bring me to the very place I'm standing today. And I'm sharing with you the exact same thing that God shared with me. It's the powerful truth, the difficult truth of God's word that changes us from the depths of our soul. And I'm honored to be able to be here to do that. And that's what we're going to continue to do here at Brentwood Lighthouse. And we're going to continue to grow together. Amen? Amen. Amen. So last week... Uh, uh, some of the things that I learned, the reason why I say that is because I'm learning. I'm learning so much. It's not that I've learned it all already. I'm learning every week because it's impossible to come here and study this word with the depth we do and not grow every week. Something I've seen is that who knew the book of Galatians was the very book to cast out the demons of legalism and ritualism and ceremonial rituals all throughout the Christian church today. When's the last time a pastor or a church leader said, did you know Galatians was the book to cast out all that legalism? <laughs> no, I didn't know that, pastor. Because you have to read it. Because you have to see it in depth for what it is. Here we are on the brink of chapter 4, and the Bible has clearly outlined... The Mosaic Law was brought in, legalism, ritualism, and Paul said, God forbid it. That somebody would judge you on a, on a Sabbath day, or what you eat, or what you drink. 
God forbid it. It's not given to the Christian church. Yet it's all over today. And these are the things that I'm learning. And I'm learning that as we speak the loving and difficult truth, because if you love someone, you don't lie to them, what do you do? You tell them the truth. And Paul reveals here in the Bible, as I'm telling the Galatians the truth, so as we tell the world the truth, this can't be in your church practices, legalism, ritualism, judging each other on days and what you do on a certain day. We read the scripture clearly. No one is to judge you on a Sabbath. Those exact words coming from the Bible. I tell you, <laughs> this book of Galatians is the book that tells you that that is forbidden in the Christian church, yet nobody seems to be reading it. And when you read the truth and you tell the world that this is the way that God said it, just as Paul will reveal to us today in Galatians 4, 12 through 20, you don't become their light. You don't become their, the blessed presence of the truth. You become their enemy. You become their enemy when you speak the truth of God. And you tell them to stop judging on days. Stop performing rituals. Stop performing ceremonial things in the church that are not to be carried into the Christian faith. It's all over. And as you'll see today, it's disturbing, distracting. It is confusing the Christian church. And I'm thankful to be here with you today. But we're going to cast all that out. I'm not going to be confused at all. I don't want you to leave here one bit confused. Amen? Amen. Last week, Paul spoke directly and purposely to the Galatians and to us. Uh, last week in Galatians 4, 8 through 11, he spoke on the futility of these rituals, the futility of this legalism. That is, all, it was all over the Galatian church, and it's all over the Christian church today, all throughout our world. And it has just totally consumed every other works-based religion. Amen? It is all over the world, everywhere in works-based religion, false religion, and it's all invaded up into the Christian faith. So it's a monster that's growing all through the world, and it's growing into the Christian faith, and God says no. The buck stops right here. Amen? Amen. 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 So last week, after giving a purpose and direct, a purposeful and direct, um, a stern rebuke, Paul turns this week in verse 12 through 20, uh, after sternly rebuking the Galatians in 8 through 11, Paul changes his approach. And he makes an appeal based on his strong affection for them. The futility of ritualism. And what that says is, in the Bible, God says, I want to tell you how much I love you, Christian faith. I want to tell how, you, how, much, how affectionate I am for you. How much I love all Christians. How much we love all brothers and sisters in Christ. And he makes his appeal based on love and affection. But the appeal is to tell them something very direct. And you know what that is, because I just covered it a minute ago. The appeal is to tell them, in all the love that I have for you, stop this nonsense. Amen? Amen. Stop this legalistic, ritualistic, you're never going to make it because you're not good enough because of something you didn't do right. Stop this nonsense. Stop it. Amen? Because when we picked up the book of Galatians, you remember in the first part of Galatians, if you remember, and I'll be glad to remind you, thank you for asking, Paul was the preacher of justification by faith. Chapter 1 and chapter 2, the principles of justification by faith, not by what you do. Amen? Amen. It's been a great book so far, this book. These are the things that God is teaching me while I'm studying, helping teach you. And I'm trying to share some of those things because I'm enriched greatly by every Sunday we gather here. 
And I want to share some of that with you. And I hope that you can share it with yourself, your heart, with God, and with others around you. What you're learning. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter through the narrow gate. The road to destruction is wide and many are on it. God is using the pure word, his holy word, here in Brentwood Lighthouse to keep us on that narrow path. God's pure word and his difficult truth is God's way of the assurance and the peace that we're on the narrow path. Casting out those demons of confusion, mistaken behaviors, problematic and distracting ideals that get in the church. God's way of assurance and peace so that we can master our peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Galatians is the book to end legalism and ritualism. And somebody in the Christian faith isn't reading it well enough. Amen? Amen. Amen. Galatians chapter 4, 12 through 20. Galatians 4, verse 12. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you. Not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I am present with you. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Uh, a little note that stuck right out to me right there as I read this. He's with them perplexed, uh, teaching and growing with them again until Christ is formed. So it's becoming pretty obvious the difficult truth is where you see legalism and where you see problematic troubles and people saying it's your behavior that is causing God not to love you and these kind of things Paul says Christ is not yet formed in you Amen. he's not formed in you because you're basing people on days and actions and behaviors and judgments and last week we studied the Christian faith does require a set of living examples and we're striving together to live up to those can any of us live according to the New Testament perfectly the New Testament authorities for clean living can we do it perfectly no so together we grow together in a basic tenet of good honest living before God not legalism not ritualism, to gain salvation, to increase salvation. And that is where the rubber meets the road. The real breakdown is right there. Verse 12. Verse 12 reads, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. The phrase, become as I am, for I also have become as you. Verse 12, Paul had been a proud, self-righteous Pharisee, trusting in his own righteousness to save him. But when he came to Christ, he abandoned all efforts to save himself, trusting wholly in God's grace. 
he urged the Galatians to follow his example and avoid the legalism of the Judaizers. You see the phrase in verse 12? You have done me no wrong. Verse 12. You have done me no wrong. Though the Jews persecuted Paul when he first went to Galatia, the Galatian believers had not harmed him at all, but enthusiastically, enthusiastically received him when he preached the gospel to them. We're going to take a little look at how that happened. Let's take a look at Acts 14, 8 through 11. We're going to look in depth at Paul's journey when he went to Galatia. Acts 14, 8 through 11. Starting in verse 8. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him, he had seen that he had faith to be made well. Said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he leapt up and began to walk. Hallelujah. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying, in the Laconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. Amen. They had a great reverence for Paul. And human beings, despite, notice how Paul said, in spite of my sickness, in spite of your weakness, in spite of your illness, in spite of your imperfection, nobody was more imperfect than Paul, according to Paul's very own words. Amen? Yet this man had a will to live and a desire to be made well, and he leapt up who had been lame from his mother's womb. Amen? Give glory to God. Amen? Amen, leapt up, and that was a man. That was not Jesus Christ himself. That was Paul, a man, just like you. It's referencing the power of God working through you. And I want to make a point here that the power of God works through you in a place, in a church, in a gathering, in a belief system that is not filled with these adverse distractions. And you know what I'm speaking of because it's what the premise of this whole book is. It's based on the true gospel. Justification by faith. The pure hand of God working in your heart. And when you believe right, Paul is teaching this to people who don't understand it. Obviously, they're misbehaving. Their church is infected with misguided teaching. But yet when Paul activates in this teaching that we're activating in this place, people jump up and be healed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Receive it. And understand the truth of God's word. When you act in the truth of the gospel, when you understand it well, God's power will seek to work through you in this way. Paul is the living example. Amen? Amen. We're also going to take a look at Acts 14. 18 through 20. We're going to get a little, an adverse look at what it's like when God uses you in this way. Acts 14, 18 through 20. Acts 14, beginning in 14, verse 18. Acts 14, 18 through 20. Even saying these things with difficulty... They restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. Uh, side note, that was Paul and Barnabas telling them, don't worship us. We're not the gods. Understand? We're not the gods. We're not this deity, this pantheon of gods that you worship. We worship the only true and living God, Jesus Christ. Amen? So after telling them, verse 18, after telling the people these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas, 
to Derby. Amen. What a contrast. First he healed. First he said, be healed. Stand up and walk. Your infirmities are gone in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he comes to town and he's stoned to death. And he's stoned to death by the very people who are bringing these false deceptive teachings into the Christian faith. This is a Christian faith. This is a Christian church. They have, this is not the Jewish synagogue. This is the Christian church that Paul had grown and developed in Galatia. And these people came in it and started bringing their mosaic laws and their rules, whatever they had that was false and deceptive, and they invaded that church. And instead of loving Paul or plucking their eyes out because they loved him so much, they looked at Paul as what? The enemy. And we're going to see that today. Okay. Verse 13. I'm going to break this down. Verse 13 reads, Galatians chapter 4, verse 13. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. Bodily illness. Some think this illness was malaria, which Paul may have contracted in the coastal lowlands, and Pamphylia, the cooler, healthier weather in Galatia, especially at Pisidian Antioch, which is 3,600 feet above sea level, this would have brought relief from a fever caused by malaria. Let's take a look at Acts 13, 13 through 16. Acts 13, 13 through 16. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paph Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch. On, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. And you can bet what Paul said, right? Paul said, you who believe in God, you worship Jesus Christ. He preached the truth of the gospel right there in the synagogue. Okay, you know what Paul did. Brethren, do you have anything to say? And Paul stood up and said, I'm glad you asked. Amen. And he gave a long, truthful sermon about the love of Jesus Christ and about justification through faith and about the blessing of God casting out those demons of legalism and ritualism. Right after having a man leap up who was lame from birth in his mother's womb. You see the picture of what's happening, right? Where does the power of God lie? In the truth. The power of God lays in the truth of God. And the power in the people in this church and the ability to heal and to bless and to find the grace and the miracles that you seek in your life lie in the truth and the power of this truth. That's why they say the gospel message is the power of God. Amen. Who understands that really? I pray that you have a better understanding of that today. The gospel message is the power of God. It is foolishness to those who seek to get attention for themselves. Amen. But it is the power of God for those who seek to obtain the likeness of Jesus Christ. Amen. These cities are Galatian uh, cities, by the way. These uh, uh, Derby, Lystra, these are all in Galatia. The note I wanted to make clear that Paul is moving from uh, the coastal region of Pamphylia into Derby, Lystra. He's moving, these are, these are Galatian cities. Amen? Amen. Verse 14. Verse 14 reads uh, Galatians 4, verse 14. And that which was a trial to you 
in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Amen? You received me. Verse 14, the Galatians welcomed Paul in spite of his illness. Now we're going to directly address our weaknesses, our sicknesses, and our imperfections. This illness was in no way a barrier to his acceptance in full authority as Christ Jesus himself. I just believe it's a little reminder that Paul and God quoted to us right here in the scripture. Like, yeah, Paul was sick. They could have easily said, he's sick, he's weak, he doesn't have anything to offer us. Look at him. But they offered him, they accepted him as Jesus Christ himself. And Paul wants you to know that my illness, you didn't loathe. My weaknesses, you didn't loathe me. You didn't want to cast me out because I had some illnesses, weaknesses, or uh, even growth issues. Just loved Paul. They loved him and received him. Verse 15. Galatians 4.15 says, Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and then given them to me. Where is the blessing you had? The word blessing here can also be translated happiness or satisfaction. Where's the great joy you had when you found the truth? And how did you get sidetracked into this garbage that is coming through this church? And I use that word literally. This is what this word is teaching me. You're going to see more they looked at Paul as an enemy. God forbid it. That is garbage. Okay? To make the one... Of, they, they received Paul as Jesus Christ himself, and now Jesus Christ through Paul is their enemy. You see why I refer that way? I use an extreme English word, like Paul used to use extreme Greek words for the most profound way. I say garbage enters the Christian church in legalism, in ritualism. It is distracting, confusing, and changing the hearts of Christians, robbing them of that power that says, God says, leap up and get up and be healed. Amen? We're going to stop that right here. Who wants that power? Who wants to share in the healing blessing of God? And if you can't see that God is not saying, get rid of these things, do away with these things, then you're missing the essence of the truth, the difficult truth of the Bible. It says, get rid of it. Amen. Paul's point, he points out that the Galatians had been so happy and content with his gospel preaching. And he wonders why they had turned against him. That is very sad. They were so overjoyed. They were so blessed. In a Christian atmosphere. And now, what are they saying? Paul, must, he must be our enemy. It's hard to stomach. It's hard to fathom how that could happen in a Christian setting. It is happening. And I say it's not good. And what causes it is not good at all. And it needs to be cast out and done away with. Amen? Pluck out your eyes. The phrase in verse 15, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Now, this may have been a figure of speech drawn from Matthew 5.29 or Matthew 18.9. Or it could have been an indication that his illness had somehow affected his eyes. For some reason, Paul referenced plucking out their eyes for him. It could have been a reflection of the Bible saying, pluck out your eye, or uh, you know the teachings in Matthew. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, and, and such not. Or Paul's very eyes could have been affected. Who's ever had a serious eye infection? I have, for one. It's very, very bad. If his eyes had somehow been affected, in either case, 
This reflects the great love that the, that the Galatians had initially expressed for the Apostle Paul. It is an expression of the great love. Maybe it's an expression of the great love you showed for me. For Pastor Anthony, when I brought the truth, I pray that I never have to say, what happened? Right? See what Paul is saying? What happened? That's real. That's sad, right? I brought you the truth. You loved me. You received me. You couldn't wait to hear the truth every week. And then what? You see what happened? That actually happened to Paul in a Christian setting. And this is what you get when you go in depth and you read the Bible and you understand what the book of Galatians says. Paul was their teacher and they ended up despising him. The only teacher we have in the truth of the gospel, the, the apostle to the Gentiles who gave his life for us. Imagine uh, despising the man who gave his very life for you to have salvation in Jesus Christ and be baptized in Christ in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Verse 16. Moving along. 16 says, verse 16, 4, chapter 4, Galatians, verse 16. So I have become your enemy by telling you the truth. Become your enemy. The Galatians had become so confused. There it is. The Galatians had become so confused that in spite of their previous affection for Paul, some or many had come to regard Paul as their enemy. The apostle reminds them that he had never harmed them, but merely told them the truth, a truth that once brought them great joy. Amen? A clear indication as he reminds them. The key here is they became confused. They became filled with doubt, regret, confusion, distraction. And it's our job, it's my job, to seek Jesus Christ, that you understand why that happened, and then you, you make sure that it never happens again. Do not let that happen. Not in Brentwood Lighthouse. The power and the healing and the blessing comes from the pure truth, the truth of the pure heart of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Verse 17. Verse 17 reads, Galatians 4, 17, They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. This just gets worse by the minute. To shut you out so that you'll seek them. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ anymore. Nothing to do with the great gift of faith. Nothing to do with salvation through faith. They, the word they in verse 17, they eagerly seek you. This refers to the false teachers, the Judaizers. They eagerly the word eagerly here in verse 17 means with a serious concern or a warm interest. So they come with a serious concern or a warm interest. This word eagerly in the original text is the same word is used to describe Paul's former zeal for Judaism in 114 in Galatians 114 we're going to take a quick look at that Galatians 114 to refresh where Paul used the same word Galatians chapter 1 verse 14 and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions okay you see the word extremely zealous in Galatians chapter 4, 17, you see the word eagerly. In the original text, it's the same word. And this same word for Paul's great zeal describes the same word. We've translated it eagerly and extremely. Those are English words. The original word is used to describe Paul's former zeal. The Judaizers appeared to have a genuine interest in the Galatians, but their true motive was to exclude the Galatians from God's gracious salvation and win recognition for themselves. I know that you've heard this 
around the world in churches. You've heard people say, he's preaching a self gospel or just open your ears and see where the stuff might invade or confuse where you've heard it. We go and we act in love. We love our brothers and sisters. These were Christians. These were people that Paul had taught justification by faith. Somehow they became confused. That happens. And if you think around the world, you say people are preaching a prosperity gospel and different things. We're not pointing the finger at anyone. I'm telling you, the Bible says these confusions get in the church. These things creep in and they mess things up and they disturb and distort. We don't want to point fingers. We want it to be healed and cured. We want the word of God, the pure truth of the gospel to be the standard. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 18. Galatians 4.18 says, But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I am present with you. Not only when I am present. Paul encouraged the Galatians to have the same zeal for the true gospel of grace that they had when he was with them. Very simple. No matter where you are, no matter where you go, no matter where you live, where God leads you in this world, you are to have the same zeal for the true gospel. That is the only thing that Paul taught, was the truth of the gospel. That is where the power lies. That is where the power of the gospel, that is where the power of the Holy Spirit, the truth, that is where less distraction, confusion is cast out. And I tell you, if you will bear with me, we're going to center on that truth from this day forward in Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. Amen? Are you with me? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Verse 19. Winding it down. Verse 19 reads... Galatians 4, 19. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. I'm again clearly depicting that Christ is not formed in them because of these distractions, because of these false teachings. Something has happened. I just want to say, if, uh, if you see this in your life, if you find confusion, if you find distraction, if you find yourself struggling, and we all do that, I am proposing to you today that the cure is the pure truth of the gospel message. Amen? And you might say, well, I think I can find it somewhere else. And I say, go ahead, because I've been looking for it for 30 years. And I haven't found it yet. And I'm advising you that I think that I found it in this very verse. I want you to study the pure truth of the gospel message. Amen? Amen. Amen. My children... Listen to this. Uh, we heard that Paul used affection in 12 through 20 to try to tell them to stop. He, he rebuked them in 8 through 11. You got to stop this nonsense. You got to get rid of this stuff. But in 12 through 20, he used his love and his affection for them. Uh, verse 19, my children, Paul's only use of this very affectionate phrase, which the apostle John had used frequently. Found in 1 John seven times, John uses this particular phrase, my children. Paul uses it only here once to express his love and the magnitude of his affection to try to make this point with the Galatians. You see the phrase, until Christ is formed in you. The powerful phrase in God's word saying, Christ is not formed. There are distractions. Christ was not formed when these things happen. You go home sick inside. Something changes and don't seem right. It sounds awful or confusing and your church is involved in something. That's the spirit telling you. And Paul says, Christ isn't yet formed in you. We are to be purely subjected to the word of God from the bottom of our hearts totally laid before him bare and let him tell you what is right. Amen? Let him tell you what is true. Find that truth. Find that power. 
the power to be healed, the power to be blessed, the power to endure anything in Jesus Christ. Amen? In contrast to the evil motives of the legalistic Judaizers, Paul sought to bring the Galatians to Christ's likeness. Can somebody say amen? amen? Let's seek to bring each other to Christ's likeness with a pure heart, and you will see clarity, refreshing, peace. You will be mastering your peace. This, bringing each other to Christ's likeness, is the pure goal of salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that again. This, seeking together Christ-likeness amongst each other, is the goal of salvation through the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Wrapping it up. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says... John uses the phrase, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Verse 20 reads, Galatians 4.20, the last verse here. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Perplexed about you. Uh, Paul's expressing that he was very distraught because there are Christians who are confused. There are Christians who have been misled and misguided. There are Christians who've been under strange doctrines, false teachings. It's everywhere. And it makes you confused and sick inside, just like the Galatians. And I want that stopped. I want that stopped in Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. I want your heart to be pure, and I want you to know how much you are loved. I want you to know how blessed you are to be chosen by God, not because of anything that you did, because he loves you more than anything in the world. And that truth of that gospel is everything. Paul was distraught. You may be distraught at times, and the truth of the gospel is going to be our resounding message. Amen? Paul was distraught because something was wrong in Galatia. You may be distraught. I may be distraught. Can we fix anything in our lives if it is wrong? Can we do that together? Only the true gospel of Jesus Christ can satisfy and help us repair our own broken lives. Will you be healed today? Will you completely surrender to Jesus Christ? Will you promise to yourself to accept and believe the true gospel of Jesus Christ? That he loves you and died on that cross to pay for your sin. And as you give your mind and your heart and your life to him, that you are completely and wholly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're out there, if you're here today and you want to reaffirm Christ, if you're out there virtually today, watching tomorrow, next week, next month or next year, we can begin that journey. We begin it with a prayer. It's not the words, it's the heart. Maybe for the first time you understand that you've been trying too hard. You've been looking at your works instead of your faith. Today we can begin. Will you receive Christ now? Pray with me. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner. I want to turn from my sins, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is your Son, 
And I believe he died for my sins and that you raised him up to life. I want to receive him into my heart and to allow him to take control of my life. I want to trust Jesus as my Savior and follow him as my Lord from this day forward. And please, Father God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Begin that journey. Stay in the Word. Don't let the enemy rob you. And we end every week. Uh, we're going to have a song, and Doug will close us with a short word. Let's take two minutes now. Two minutes to just depressurize. I want you to leave here relaxed. I pray that you will leave here refreshed, blessed, committed to the truth of the gospel message. Angela will start a little music for two minutes, and uh, Doreen will prepare to come and sing for us. And uh, I want to thank you.